Okay, so let us carry on with the third lecture on the chapter of consciousness, sleep, dreams, and drugs. In the last um, lecture, I was talking about just the stages, just introduced the idea of sleep cycles. These four sleep, these four, the, the idea that we cycle through and about four of them a night, um, basically, and then we start all over. And then um, <clears throat> I also made reference to a concept called hypnagogic hallucinations, which just to be clear, refers to it's a state of consciousness between sleep and wakefulness and um, we call them hallucinations because you might uh, be thinking that things are happening in the room. Um, I mentioned that some researchers argue that when people claim to have been abducted by aliens it is actually a hypnagogic hallucination and it's really about that that <clears throat> certain parts of our brain fall asleep or come out of um, sleep states at different um, at different paces and so it's this brief moment between um, one stage and another. I did read something that suggested that it's more common in younger people and as you age you have fewer of them which is kind of for me unfortunate because I always kind of thought it was cool like I really dig becoming or or tuning in to the experience of falling asleep. I find that to be like I try to pay attention to it, um, but I can remember as a young person, oh, and it's also worse when you're under stress or when there's times of, of really profound neurological development. But I do remember one time when I was about 19 and I was very, very homesick and very, very miserable. And I swore I heard my mother in the other room. I was living, I was living out of state. There was no way that was my mother but I, rem I still remember that vividly, that I, I thought that was my mom and I was so disappointed to wake up and find out it wasn't her in the other room. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I did, went back to screen share because there's a couple images that I wanna draw your attention to. This is a really important one. Um, it is a question that I will ask you about on a quiz uh, and a test, uh, two tests probably, are what are some of the consequences of sleep deprivation? Again, this is kind of a soapbox I stand on. Uh, that you should get enough sleep. What this particular image is, is it's an image of the, what happens in the brain and specifically how that relates to mood. Uh, so in this person over here, you have somebody that's, we're gonna clinically define as sleep deprived and sleep deprivation can begin as quickly as four hours of sleep, of, of a cumulative collective sleep deprivation. So two nights in a row, of say getting five hours instead of seven hours, could you would begin to experience some of these symptoms. <clears throat> and this, um, this is a functional MRI. So it specifically is reading, I think that's right, an fMRI. It is reading the brain activity and these two images are the amygdala. Going back to the last chapter when we were talking about the amygdala and the amygdala is, is mood and anger. And this person over here who, were, who have been diagnosed, who we're calling sleep deprived, we've been not denied deep wave sleep, um, their amygdala is more active than this person. So what's the implication of that? What's the implication of a person who has a, an, an active amygdala compared to somebody who doesn't? Well, they're irritable, right? Um, my husband used to, he just quit after 20 years, but he used to work a, a second job where um, he was one night a week, he was gone all night, um, you know, at, at taking care of some business. And every Sunday, I, I would bet a dollar, nearly every Sunday, he was kind of a jerk. And he'd yell at the dishes and he'd yell at the cats because he was tired. I mean, you all know that. You all know that when you get tired, you get moody. That's because of your amygdala. Your amygdala, is, oh, it has more activity. At the same time, we have a diminished ability to respond quickly, our reaction time. That's why we shouldn't be driving when we're sleep deprived. Uh, we have a hard time thinking in complicated, uh, in complex problem solving sort of stuff. <clears throat> so you've got reaction time, problem solving, um, metabolism. Um, I think I mentioned this one in a previous slide that, that people who are sleep deprived gain weight. Right, and that's because their body, uh, the relationship between their endocrine system and their metabolism is their body is reading sleep deprivation as a form of stress and their their body and their brain can't distinguish if they are stressed because they're they have, they have no energy because they need food 
course, they have no energy because they're tired. So often, uh, again, third shift workers, but often um, sleep deprived people have an increased appetite. And they particularly like fatty foods that are high in calorie because their body is reading distress as hunger. You know, what I, what I often say is if you're uh, hungry and maybe you're trying not to eat so much, consider taking a nap because you may wake up and you won't be hungry anymore. Again, it may not be hunger. It may just be your body is craving energy and it thinks through eating that it will gain that energy. Um, and it throws off your endocrine system. So your endocrine system, you'll remember, is your hormone system, and that has implications for uh, how you pro how you digest and how you metabolize sugar. Throws off your endocrine system. Throws off your metabolism, basically. <laughs> so sleep sleep deprivation makes you irritable. Uh, you can't respond as quickly, and you eat more. All right, bingo. And you don't heal as quick. Okay, this is another fun picture. Um, if my picture was out of the way. You would see it's the theories of why we sleep. Um, there's basically two, uh, yeah, two theories as to why we sleep. Um, and what this illustrates is that it's just another picture of what I'm already talking about, but that REM sleep, right, the deeper, uh, deeper wave sleep has more <clears throat> blood flow to certain regions of the brain compared to normal. I don't know what I call it normal, but this is non-REM sleep. So this is the short wave, and this is the deep wave. Your brain is quite active. A couple theories, um, and I do ask you to be able to describe one of these theories, whichever one you think makes the most sense. The restorative theory, which um, is probably the one that I would advocate for, but the restorative theory says that it is during sleep that we heal, and that the reason that we have different stages of sleep is because um, they heal different parts of our brain and our body. Short wave patterns when our brain is in, you know, like this is when it's kind of paradoxical to me, but it's short wave pattern that that's what heals the body. So if you think about when you're sick, you're probably more in short wave sleep. Um, law, deep wave sleep, which is your REM and your dream sleep, this is thought to restore the mind and the brain. So babies, oh, no, it's the other way around. People who are suffering neurological uh, spend more time in deep wave sleep. There's, there's also an interesting, um, an interesting working hypothesis right now that suggests that as elderly, let me make sure I got this right, elderly people spend less time in deep wave sleep. And there's a theory that says that that has implications for depression and dementia, right? Because again, if this is true, if this theory is true, and this is when the brain heals, you need to have a certain amount of your sleep in, you need to have a certain amount of your sleep in deep wave sleep in order for your brain to heal. But children, um, babies in particular, whose bodies are doing a lot of growing, right, or sick, or when you're ill, you spend more time in the shallow wave sleep because you're, it's trying to restore different parts of, different parts of you. Um, and then, of course, some of the theories now that are talking, that are trying to, that are suggesting that it actually clears out certain toxins of your brain that would fall under the uh, restorative theory, which is also may explain why um, your memory begins to deteriorate when we're sleep deprived because you haven't cleared out all that gunk. I should find that video. And then there's the adaptive theory. And the adaptive theory simply says that your reason we sleep at night is because we cannot see at night. That's that evolutionary psychology that I've talked about before. But the theory just says that we are adapting to the environment and as human animals, right? And this is the theory that offers, that explains why we sleep more in the winter than we do in the summer, because it's colder, you use more energy in the winter to stay warm. <clears throat> and so therefore you sleep more because <clears throat> you're gonna burn fewer calories sleeping. It's going to be easier to stay warm when you're asleep than it will be to stay awake. And then, yeah, okay. Um, and I think, oh, there, there you go. There's more of the same thing. Why do we sleep? Restorative theory says we sleep to heal. And adaption says we sleep because we can't see at night and it wants to keep us safe. And so when you're sleeping, you're not out wandering in the dark. You're not out wandering in the snowstorm. Um, and you're all, oh, I love sleep. I'm a big fan of it.
um, I think it can be kind of like a drug actually. And it totally makes sense that it would be like a drug to people because it is, uh, it does change your consciousness much the same way the drugs do. Okay, I want to stop here. And when on the next video lecture, I want to talk about sleep disorders. It's kind of fun to talk about these and make sure that I know what I'm going to do um, and just and dreams. So I'm going to stop right here. See you in the next one.